So hello, everyone, and thanks for joining me tonight. I'm Jill Cleese. I am the SJSU SLIS Career Center Liaison. And tonight, this workshop is focused on the job search. And it's set up to be an informal Q&A discussion. So I really want to hear from all of you and answer your questions. I have a few slides set up in here, but you know this is just to keep it rolling along. I really am hoping that you'll have questions for me so that this can really be um, an informal dialogue and you get to questions, you'll get questions answered. Since this is the last career development workshop for the semester, you can certainly ask me other career related topics as well if you're curious about, you know, if you have resume questions or interviewing. I'm sure we'll have some time to um, answer those types of questions as well. So feel free. And if you're interested in any specific, more specific information on resume writing or interviewing or using LinkedIn, uh, there's a lot of other career webcasts that I've done in the past. And I put the link here on this main page here where it says find recordings to past workshops. If you're not familiar where those are, it's just on the career development tab and you open it up and it says career webcasts. And you'll find all the recordings to the past workshops and the recording to this workshop will be housed there as well. As you know, this session is being recorded, and that's where I will have the recording up um, in the next couple of days. All right, so if you have, or I shouldn't say if, when you have questions, go ahead and ch put them in the chat box, or you can certainly raise your hand, and I will let go of the mic and let you pick that up as well, too. Yeah. Amelia, you want to pull up the link for that really fast, if possible? So it's right under Swiss Career Dev, and it's the Career Webcast page. We'll probably get that up there in just a second, Matthew. Amelia's my helper. She's much better at multitasking than I am when I do these sessions. <laughs> so how many people, just a show of hands, how many of you um, are graduating this month? Anybody? Nice. One person. Woohoo! Congratulations to you. So you're going to be looking for a full-time job. Yeah. You're like, yay, me. Um, other people, are you looking for internships or part-time jobs, or what are other people looking for? Just out of curiosity. Internship and our part-time, okay. Graduated. Graduate in December. I want to get it. Oh, nice. That's good. Okay. So everything I'm going to talk about is really. Um, you know, no matter what you're searching for, it's all gonna it's all gonna make sense. It's all gonna be good stuff. And Matthew, you've got part time jobs, but don't need your internships for sure. Okay, so moving on here. So why are you guys here tonight? Meaning, you know, what do you, what are your questions about job searching, or what brings you to this workshop, or what thoughts do you have about job searching? If you've got anything right now, go ahead and type it in. Um, that way, I can make sure I get to those questions. So I'll just give you a minute if there's anything you, you have a burning question at this moment. It doesn't look like anybody has a burning question. Oh, there we go. There's a couple people. All right, so I'm going to give you a moment to type those in. Okay, so Tibby is looking for some great sources as to where to search for jobs. So I'll have some of those up coming up towards the end of my slides. And then um, at that point, I like if people have things to share with us so that we can collaborate as a group and get some additional ideas. So we will be talking about that. So Lauren Tia, Canadian, interned in the States last summer and met a boyfriend there. So if there's any visa tips. Oh, interesting. Um, do you know of the website uh, IFLA, International? I think it's IFLA. Am I thinking of that correctly? Does that sound right to anybody where it's all about international jobs? We have that actually on our website. I don't know if you, if you can find that really quick, Amelia, and put that one up there. Think, yeah. I think that's what it's called, International Federation of Libraries. It's something like that. Someone's going to find it and we'll put it up here. But that would be a good place to check. There's also um, a website called Going Global. And that's usually if we want to work internationally. But you can use it reverse for you wanting to come here to the States. And that's got some really good information in there as well. So Going Global. Um, and there's another one. That's, I can picture the book. I can't think of the exact title. Or something about 
I'll have to think about it. I can picture the book in my head. And Amy, you're looking for online work. So that's an interesting one, too. We're actually in the process of trying to pull together some websites of uh, more uh, virtual types of work. But you could actually do, use your, use your SLIS skills um, and do some research on some of those websites for searching for uh, virtual jobs because they exist. So that might be something very cool just to check out. And then, frankly, if you find some, send them my way because that's something I want to start to compile. Hmm. Okay, Megan's not getting any audio. Um, Megan, did you do the audio? Oh, you can't hear me, actually. Let's see. Let's see if she did the audio setup wizard and get her started that way. Oh, that's it, I-N-A-L-J. No, that's I need a library job. There's the one for um, international jobs. Okay, I'm going back through questions, guys. Okay, Bertha, how do you make your resume look relevant when you don't have any previous library experience? That's a great question. There's a lot of things that you can do, uh, Bertha, and this it goes for everybody. So you got to work with what you have. So obviously, you're going to have your MLIS. You can include some of the coursework that you've taken. So you can list some of the titles of the courses that you've taken. And it's better to list the titles of courses that relate to the kinds of jobs that you're interested in. You can also have a section on your resume for projects. And you want those projects are coming from your coursework. So anything that you've done, either independently, with small groups, virtually with people, um, being a student assistant, anything that you've done while you're a student, that could be included on your resume. It could be under projects. It could be under leadership experience if you're part of one of the student organizations. If you're not part of the student organizations and you need some experience, you might even consider doing that just to have more things to be able to include on your resume. Um, and then, of course, you're going to get you know, volunteers somewhere or start to get an internship. But that's how you start to build your experience so that it shows that you have some relevant related experience. Um, you also look at some of the past jobs that you've had. And rather than really listing out accomplishments that relate to a past job that doesn't really relate to the LIS field, you think about the skills that you developed in that job that can transfer over. Um, into the LIS field. So those could be things like researching, um, working with customers, um, working with diverse people, good communication skills. So there's a lot of transferable skills that we gain from past experience that you can put on your resume to show how those can work into a library setting. Let's see what else we have. Thanks for the websites. Headset. Okay, and Amelia's on top of helping Megan. Um, I found listing projects. Great. Oh, nice. Good. Okay, here's another question from Amy. Is it better to do a CV than a resume? So, Amy, that totally depends on the kinds of jobs that you're looking for. So, really, most jobs, the vast majority of jobs, when you go to apply, they're asking for a resume. So, in that case, it's best to spend your time and energy putting together a well-developed resume. However, if you're going to be looking for jobs in the academic setting specifically, and you notice that some of those are asking for a CV, because typically a CV is only used in academic settings and maybe some government settings, um, then in, or, or internationally, if you were going to be looking for jobs internationally, they often will use CVs. So it really depends on the type of job that you're looking for. But again, the vast majority will be using a resume. Sometimes you'll even see on job descriptions, send a CV or a resume. And in that case, I would send the one that does the best job of representing you on paper. All right. It might be Megan, actually. I'm not sure if it's Megan or Megan, but yeah, you can hear. So Matthew, I, I talked about the difference. Oh, well, really, the difference here between the CV and a resume. A resume is shorter, obviously, one to two pages. And it's really tailored and targeted towards a specific job. So it's more skill-based. It's focused on your skill words that match a job description. A CV, on the other hand, um, doesn't have a limitation on how many pages it is. And it's usually a summary of 
everything that you've done. So that's where you would include all, you know, your experience, um, presentations you've given, publications, anything you've written, awards, honors. I mean, it's, it's a summary of everything. So it's much bigger, much more in depth. All right. Looks like Berth has got another question, maybe a couple more. Thanks, Amelia, for putting those links up. All right. All right, Bertha's typing a question in. So these are good questions. As you think of some other ones, keep them coming, because I'm happy just to, just to kind of go through your questions during this time. Hey, Amelia, were you able to find that link to the, um, the international jobs I'm thinking of? Is it I-F-L-A? I can't remember now. All right, so I'm going to move to the next slide, but I will keep checking questions. Um, I put a link up a, few, a little while back for the ALA um, International Library Jobs site, which seemed like it had a lot of good stuff awesome. on it. Oh, good. OK, good. Thank you. That's excellent. Thanks for doing that. Um, here we go. Here's Bertha. Is there a link to be a part of a student organization? I'm not near the campus, so I never thought of doing something like that. Yeah, uh, actually, Amelia might be able to find that one, too. There is information on SLIS Web about the student organizations. And um, yeah, really, most students are not near campus. So you can absolutely get involved with them um, and do your work virtually. So that's a good option. Again, it's on Swiss Web. You could probably just type in the search box, student organizations, it'll pop up. And then also think of professional associations, joining professional associations, because you get a uh, very discounted rate as a student. Um, so it's a great way to get involved, connect with other people, hear from um, professionals in the field. You can go to conferences, network with people, connect with them on LinkedIn. So those are some really good things to help keep yourself connected into the field and make some really good contacts with folks. So here, Matthew, I'll go back for the, uh, the link to the past recordings. It was right here. Oh, actually, it just says, uh, if you just, it's probably back here in the chat box, but if you just go to the tab on the main solicitor's homepage, this, there's the career development tab. And you just open, scroll down, and it'll say career webcast. And that's where you find all the past uh, recordings right there. Thanks, Amelia, putting all the links up. We're keeping you busy tonight. <laughs> OK. So keep the questions coming. But um, I'll move along the slides, just so we don't have our lag time. Thanks, Amelia. All right, so a big part of conducting your job search is to have a clear focus. And that really includes part of knowing yourself, which means your skills, your unique skills, your interests, and your abilities. And it's about understanding the value add that you can bring to an employer. And that's also going to help you when you're writing your resume and when you're looking at the types of positions that might fit for you and will help you articulate your competencies during the interview. So I guess really my question to you guys is, how many of you feel pretty solid identifying your skills, your interests, and your abilities? If you needed to really kind of identify that so you knew what kinds of jobs to search for. OK, good. So we've got a couple people. But we do want to have more. So I think it can be it can be a tricky area, right? When people go, well, so what are your strengths? What are your skills? What are you good at? We kind of freeze. So before you can really conduct a solid job search, you've got to know what you're bringing to the table. What's your value add? So there is, um, they're actually, again, on the career development site, um, right up at the, the top tab that says career development, there's some self-assessment exercises in there that you might want to take a look at which can help you get kind of clear on what some of your strengths are. You can also set up an appointment with me. We can talk virtually on the phone, if that works, or Skype or Google Hangout, whatever you want to do. And we could kind of talk it through a little bit. Um, I could take a look at your resume. And sometimes from that, or me asking you questions about your resume, helps me pull up skills that you haven't even thought of as a skill. So there's a process that you kind of want to start to go through so that you get really clear about who you are before you can figure out what you want to do. 
So let's see, Lara. Knowing and being able to communicate an interview is where my failure is. Hmm. So that's pretty common, um, I'm, and I'm glad you know what they are. So what we might want to do, Lara, is, is set up some time to do some mock interviewing. And again, we can do that over the phone, so it can be like a real practice phone interview. And I can ask you some questions, and we can practice that way. There's also a great tool. Again, I'm telling you more websites, but it's on, it's on Swiss Web in the career development section under interviewing. And there's a tool there called Big Interview. Uh, it's a great resource, but few students know about it or use it. But it's actually an online mock interviewing tool. So you can actually record yourself and show yourself if you want to on the screen. Practice your interviewing questions. It will record you, and then you can hear it back. Or you can s click on little videos of other people doing an interview, and you can hear how they sound and how they answer questions. So I really do recommend that for people as a great, just a great tool to use. So again, it's under that career development tab, under interviewing, and it's called Big Interview. So that would be a great, great tool to use. OK. So again, part of getting focus, one is knowing about yourself, but the other part is then knowing what type of LIS positions you're seeking. So there's a few of these questions here, meaning what type of work do you want to do? It might be a job title, might be a work function. Maybe you're not even there yet. Maybe you know some of the skills and competencies that you want to use. There's the industries to consider, and this was just a few of them, but there's many different industries that you could think about where you're interested in working, and even the kind of company culture that you're interested in, because that makes a difference as well. So these are things you want to think about. You might want to take the needed time before you actually start doing your job search and just sit back and kind of look at these questions and gain some clarity. Because really, it's pretty darn typical for us not to take time to think of these things, and we just start to jump into a job search. We think, OK, I've got my resume. I'm just going to look on the internet. I'm going to find a few jobs. I'm going to hit the send button, and then, you know, boop, call it a day. I, I did my job search. I applied for jobs. And then we sit back, and we kind of wait, and we hope that we're going to hear back. But often we don't, because our search wasn't really targeted. It wasn't purposeful in what we were doing. And then it starts to take a toll on our confidence. So it's worthwhile to take some time to really kind of sit back and be a little more purposeful in the focus for your job search. Um, Another thing that you could do to kind of get yourself clear, too, is in, in doing a little bit more research about what's out there, think about talking with people in the fields that sound interesting to you. Overall, the term is we call that informational interviewing. Um, you can do it on the phone. You can email with people. You can do it with people in person. But it's really starting to find people who are doing jobs or working in places that you're thinking about and gaining a little more information about what it's really like to work there, what are the kinds of the skills and qualifications they look for in people? You can ask what the actual hiring process is like. So just gathering a little more information will actually help you be a little more successful and focused when you go to do your job search. It's like spending your time in a more productive way versus feeling at some point then like you've just wasted a bunch of time. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right, as you guys think about things, though, do keep them coming. OK, so another piece to do a successful job search um, is to make a plan. <laughs> so I talk a lot about having a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. So plan A is really the ideal job. It's what you imagined you'd be doing when you decided to go to library school. Um, but maybe since starting the program, maybe you've changed your mind. Maybe you've gathered some more information. You've got some other ideas about what you want to do, which is fabulous. But again, plan A is kind of that ideal job or the dream job. And it's good to have that. You've got to shoot for that. But if that doesn't happen or it doesn't happen quick enough, what's your plan B, the backup plan? And you can use this same strategy when you're looking for an internship or you're looking for a part-time job, right? We all have that ideal internship that we're, that we're thinking about. But if for some reason we don't get it, we still need to get an internship because it's super important. So what's the backup plan? What's the plan B? So plan B is, you know, what else have you considered? What are the things you're thinking about? Or where else might your skills transfer to? Or what's the other thing that you imagined yourself doing? So think about that. And you may want to write these down for yourself, too, just so you're very clear about, all right, here's, here's what I really want to focus on. 
but if that's not coming through, I'm going to put a little bit of energy into this middle column, my plan B. And then if all else fails, that's my plan C. If all else fails, what's the backup to my backup plan? When I think about that, it's like, look, if all else fails, what is that thing that I know that I can do? Um, sometimes people have that in mind already. Sometimes they know there's a place that people said, hey, if you ever want to work here, you know, you could get a job. And you've just kind of gone, mm, yeah, that's great. But, you know, maybe it's the time that you, you go back to that. Or maybe you were in an internship or even volunteering somewhere. And maybe it came to an end, but they said, you know, if you, if you want to stay on longer, you can. And you went, mm, yeah, maybe, but I'm going to look at some other things. Well, maybe the, maybe the plan C is to pick that up and go back to it. So it's just, again, about looking at your options. Another solid plan for Plan C is to think about using a placement agency or a temporary agencies. There are a lot of them that are related to the LIS field. Again, we have a section on the career development site. I did put the web address this time up here. It's right here. Um, so it's under career development, and you go to job search and agencies. And there's a lot of good information there on, one, how to use an agency, but secondly, some uh, links to different agencies out there that place people in LIS jobs. So it's definitely worth checking out. A lot of the jobs with the federal government are going through agencies as well, and sometimes those are very long term. So again, the address is here on the right here up on the slide, Tiffany. But again, if you just go to Swiss Web, right, the main home page, there's a tab at the top that says Career Development. And under that tab, one of the options is Job Search and Placement Agencies. So if you're multitasking right now, you might be able to pull that up. No problem. I'm not good at multitasking while I do these things. I'm always afraid something's going to happen to my computer and I'll lose my <laughs> lose my Blackboard Collaborate. So I just stick right here. Um, questions. Do you guys have any questions so far about Plan A is making a or using an agency? Does anybody have any questions about that? I know quite a few students who got jobs actually back in D.C. Um, federal jobs through an agency, and they were they're long term, like they're two year contract kinds of jobs and then they often get extended. OK. So another thing to consider when you're doing your job search is asking yourself some of these questions. And I don't like people to answer the questions at this particular moment, because usually we'll look at it and we'll say no, 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 and no. But if you are open-minded about your job search, and flexible, and you're willing to consider some other options, you really might just kind of want to sit and think about some of these questions. Um, if there's other people in your life that you'd have to talk about, talk about with, I mean, to see if these are options, you know, do it. Engage in a conversation. I've known several graduates from the program who graduated. I will explain that in just a moment. Thank you, Matthew. Who graduated and were doing their job search. Most of them, they, were, they happened to be locally here at the time, and it was taking them a long time. And then they decided they were going to open up their job search to other areas. Um, for some people here in Northern California, they were interested. They, they opened it up to moving down to Southern California. And then some people actually opened them up to moving to other states. They were very open to it. And they noticed that right away it started to open doors to interviews. They were getting many more interviews than they had previously. And I know of a student who actually just got, uh, he, he lives down south, he just got his job offer for Kansas. Certainly wasn't his first choice to go to Kansas. Uh, he's married and has children, but you know what? They're going for it. And so what I'll tell people in opening up your options and being open-minded is that that job that you get once you graduate doesn't or typically isn't the last job you're ever going to have. It's a stepping stone. So sometimes when I think about these questions, I'll think, well, you know, if I were to move somewhere else, depending on what my life is like. Could I do that for a year or two years? You know, could, would that be realistic for me? Could I actually do that? And then it gets me more experience on my resume. I'm increasing my network of people. Um, and then maybe after that two years, then I reevaluate. And then maybe I come back or start to do a job search and I look somewhere else. So it, again, it's just about being open-minded and thinking about what your options really are. So just with that said, I just encourage you to think about it. So number four, Matthew, the portfolio career. 
portfolio career is when people have, instead of a full-time job, which is what they, you know, usually want, but sometimes that's not coming along quick enough, they might pick up two or maybe three part-time jobs or two part-time jobs and a contract or project here or something like that. So it's pulling together pieces to kind of create a full-time job. Some people consciously choose a portfolio career because they like how that fits with their life. Other people don't necessarily choose it, but sometimes it just happens. But it's another strategy to think about. It's another option. It's not always the first option that people think about, but it is a viable option. It keeps people working. It keeps present employment on the resume, which is important. It helps you continue to develop skills and experience and keep networking with people. And so you may have a portfolio career why you're then searching for a full-time job on the side. So that's an option as well. And if, actually, if you even want to do more about it, you could do a very simple internet search on it and just read more about how people are doing portfolio careers. Um, it's been around for quite a while. And I just recently read an article about it, that it was, and I realized, wow, it's still kind of a, a thing that people are doing. And I hadn't thought about that for a while. Looks like there's a couple questions coming in. There we go. Ah, nice. Portfolio career. Portfolio careers is your plan A. That's excellent. I think there's plenty of opportunity for it. I really do. Again, it, it goes back to just being open-minded, um, networking, talking to people, being curious. That's good. Yeah. It's right. I think people, do, we do it and we don't always know the name. So it's actually, it's a viable option. The job search strategy, the portfolio career. <laughs> I think it was R. <laughs> Second a full-time job sounds boring. Yeah. There is some nice variety to doing different things. All right. Keep the questions coming. Why do people obsess over getting a full-time job? Well, I think there's a lot of people who want to, I don't know if you're at a rhetorical question or if you really wanted the answer for it. <laughs> but um, I mean, I think for people, part of it is wanting some sense of security. Yeah, the benefits. That's what I'm thinking. The benefits, the stability, the security. Yeah. OK, he really does want an answer. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really what it is about for people. Um, sometimes if people are, are, have families, they really need that full-time job because they need the benefits. Maybe they want to get somewhere where there's actually some retirement, 401k. So it just depends on people's values, really, when we think about career development and what people are looking for. Yeah, paid vacation, sick time, exactly. So it just depends on what's important to people. Um, sometimes when people are younger, they don't care so much. A portfolio career is fine, moving around, having the flexibility. And then sometimes you get to a certain age and you want something a little more stable. But it's good that we have so many options for different jobs that can suit different people's styles and their values. So here are some ideas of where to start searching for jobs. So networking, let's see if there's any questions in here. No, I don't think it's weird if you're young and you want stability at all. Again, it really goes back to our values, and that's something that we don't often sit and think about as well. But it's what's important to us personally. Um, and if having stability, a sense of stability and security um, is important to us, then absolutely go for it. Hmm. Yeah, healthcare is a big one for people. Let's see. The librarian recommended looking for a job in the pool. I think she meant a group of less experienced librarians who do substitute work for other librarians or online. Do you know what she might have been talking about? Yeah, actually a pool, at least from my experience with the pool, is, is, is kind of that. Yeah, it's, it could be substituting. It could be when they have a position to fill and they don't have a person to fill it, they might go to this pool of people and pull pool, <laughs> pull somebody from the pool who's there. Um, it definitely can be subbing, it can be filling in, maybe someone's going to go on maternity leave so it's a short term, they might go to their pool and find somebody there. 
I think it's another good option. When I was out of graduate school, I definitely got into some different pools at community colleges. And that allowed me to, again, kind of have that portfolio career after graduate school so that I was able to keep working, keep some things current on my resume while I was sort of looking for the job, the real job that I wanted. But it was a good thing to do, and it still helped me develop some more experience and skills. So it doesn't hurt. I, w I would recommend it. Well, it's interesting. Are they most common at community colleges? Um, I don't, I, let's see, um, I th I'm pretty sure I've heard it from public, library, public libraries as well, could have a pool of people when they're pulling for, the subst for substitutes, like to work on the weekends and those late night shifts. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Thanks, Amelia. Amelia, Amelia pulled up, a, dang, you're quick at pulling those links up. Excellent. <laughs> Yeah, so public and university libraries both hire subs. OK, so both of those could have a pool. And they usually only open up the pool at certain times. Um, you know, if they have enough people in their, in their pool, they won't open it up. And then there's certain times where that pool gets low because people have moved on. They have full-time jobs. They don't want to do it anymore. And then they'll open up the pool to get some people in there. And school districts have their own thing. All right, so, so there's some variety. But that would be part of contributing to that portfolio career as well. But I think if you have the opportunity to apply for one, it's a good thing to do. OK, so back to some ideas for where to search. So you, hopefully everybody's heard that networking is really the best job search strategy. And I really can't stress that enough. Um, it's not just about doing a job search online finding job boards, finding job openings, hitting the button, and feeling like you did a job search. You're not going to get the best results doing that, even though that tends to be what most people do, and we just automatically think about that. But oftentimes there, your resume just goes into a black hole. So it doesn't hurt to look online. I mean, I do it too, because it gives me sort of a pulse of what's happening out there. I get an environmental scan of who's hiring, what are the jobs, what kind of skills they're looking for. But if I'm really interested in a particular job, I might go back to my network to see if I know of somebody who knows of somebody who's working at that particular place who might be able to give me some information about what that particular job is like, what it's like to work there, or maybe they can get my resume into the hands of a hiring manager. But also through your networking, you're just going to find out about job opportunities that aren't even posted. There's really a small percentage. The research shows it's about 20% of open jobs are the ones that are posted on job boards. And the rest are what we call in the hidden job market, which you find out through networking. Uh, and just a good example, um, I've tapped, just recently kind of tapped back into my network of people that I'd worked with many, many years ago. And it really, really came about LinkedIn. I was kind of playing around on LinkedIn one day, and I found some people that I'd worked with, and so connected with them. And you know, then it was like, hey, you want to have coffee? You want to have lunch? And then I sort of just put out there a job idea. So, so you know, I'm thinking about transitioning over into you know this area. What's going on in your company? And people are like, oh yeah, well you should talk to this person, or if you really want some help, I'm willing to help you. Or you know, people are just very willing to provide information. So I would you know really do tap into your network. So most jobs aren't posted because, well, let me back up. I don't have a network. OK, well, I'll go back to that one, too. Most jobs aren't necessarily posted um, because employers would rather hire somebody who comes in as a referral, an employee referral. The latest statistics that I saw were they have a four times greater chance of having an interview, getting an interview, if somebody referred you rather than just being in the black hole. So. Recruiters, companies, they get you know hundreds, hundreds, could be thousands of resumes from people just applying. And it's hard to go through all of those and make sense of people. So they would actually, um, maybe recruiters go through the back end of LinkedIn and they find people that they're looking for for jobs. Or as jobs become available, they can go to their pool of people that they know and get some good candidates before they ever even have to post that job externally or outside. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, but that's, and you want to do, you want to use every strategy that you have available to you. So I'm certainly not saying don't use the internet, but you want to not have that be your sole purpose or your, your, main, your main job searching source. You want to use all of your options. 
So Matthew also said, I don't have a network. How do I build one? So you build one by all the students, co your cohorts, that you're meeting in this list program. You connect with them on LinkedIn. Um, professors, faculty members, you might connect with them on LinkedIn. You think about people who you've worked with in the past. So they can be in your network. Maybe you find them on LinkedIn. Um, join professional associations, as I mentioned earlier, and actually go to some conferences, go to some workshops, go to some networking events, and make some connections with people. Get some business cards. Introduce yourself. That's something if you want to talk more about how to do that, I can, we can talk about that. I also have some past uh, workshops on networking and informational interviewing, which would be very helpful for you to go back and review some of those. But you just start thinking big. You can think about family, friends, people, that, you know, for your friends, know other people. Um, sometimes it comes down to somebody that you bump into, you know, say you, say you go to a coffee shop close by and you walk in and you see the same person all the time and you say hello. That person can be part of your network, actually is part of your network. Because those are most random conversations that come up when you sort of put out there something you're interested in, you're looking for, and people always go, oh, wait, you know what? I know somebody who works in a library. Maybe you should go talk to them. So I mean, just random things start to come up. So it's really about thinking big and thinking, I guess, maybe informally about who are all the people that you know versus thinking this is this formal network, who are these people? So hopefully that makes sense. Is it really a disadvantage to not be on LinkedIn? I think that's a great question. So I have two answers for it. Um, one is, I really feel like, I feel strongly that if it's not your thing, then don't do it. Because if you're going to do it, you want to do it well. You want to build your profile up because your profile becomes an extension of your resume. It becomes your online presence. Um, but with that said, it depending on the industry that you're going into, now I found that if people are in nonprofit organizations, I found a lot of academic librarians, younger ones are on LinkedIn, older ones don't even have a profile or they have it up and there's nothing on it. Uh, public libraries, well, the people that I've checked out in public libraries do are on LinkedIn. Um, other people that are in kind of a um, technology or business setting, definitely it's on LinkedIn. So one, it's going to depend on your industry, right? But all the employers that I talk to, recruiters, recommend that new grads have a LinkedIn profile. Uh, most recruiters say the statistic now is that 93% of them will use social media, typically LinkedIn, in some way to look for candidates. I know a number of people who have been contacted through LinkedIn because there was a recruiter or hiring person looking at their profile. So again, I think it's another one of those strategies that can be very useful. But it, as I say, if it's not your thing, don't do it. I found it a great way to connect with people, to build my network, and to use as a great source to research where people are working, what their job titles are, I can look at where they graduated, what their majors are. So you could use it, all of you could use it to do an advanced search. You could put in San Jose State University as the school, and you could put in library as a keyword, and then see who comes up. And it's really fun just to see where people are working, what they're doing in their jobs, who's hiring librarians. I have air quotes around it because there's lots of titles that don't even have a librarian in the title. But you could use it as a great source for researching. So if all else, I might use it just for that. <clears throat> Will I be turned down for a job because I'm not into Facebook? Um, it's a good question, Matthew. I'm going to say that it's only going to depend on what the job is, meaning if it's a job that's requiring someone to be very savvy with social media, um, and some library jobs are because that's part of the nature of that job, then yeah, perhaps. But overall, I would say no. Um, Facebook's become more of a, a personal uh, platform for social media, and more and more employers are staying away from Facebook and using things such as LinkedIn. So I don't think so. It's a good question. That, that's just my opinion, but I don't think so. And I've, I've never, ever heard that from an employer, again, unless it's 
part of the job you're applying for. Okay, it looks like Tiffany's got a question coming. <clears throat> So while I wait for Tiffany's question, I'll just kind of head back to some of these areas to search for. Um, so actually, while we were talking about networking, oh, OK, no problem. Do you have any other questions about networking overall or uh, informational interviewing, what that's all about, or using LinkedIn? If you have any questions about those, go ahead and type them in. We talked a little bit about professional associations already. But I really do recommend that you join some and get involved in them as much as you can, as much as it fits into your life, because it really is good information that you can also include on your resume if you're involved in maybe a leadership role um, and a great way to contact, uh, network with people. Let's see, Bertha has a question. In the topic of social media, should we have separate personal and professional online presence? OK, that's a good question. Um, if they are separate, which you could, you have to make sure that your privacy settings are really strong. Because if somebody goes to the internet and puts in your name, no matter if you had it a personal or a professional online, it's going to pop up, right? So that's the thing you have to be careful with. So overall, the rule of thumb is to think about whatever you have out on the internet, whatever is in public domain, is something that you would be OK if an employer saw it. I guess you, gotta think about, you have to think about it like that. But otherwise, again, you, you really have to have some seriously strong privacy settings so that it wouldn't pop up. Hopefully, that answers your question. Um, what's this one? If someone introduces you to someone else, how do you keep a conversation going after so and so said I should talk to you? <laughs> All right, let me think about that. Um, well, it's really going to be about what did you want to talk to them about? So I'm just going to make something up. Say, say it's that you met that person at this coffee shop and said, oh yeah, my neighbor works at a library. You really should talk to her. So I might go great and get that person's contact information, might email that person or call and leave them a voicemail and say, hi, this is Jill. I got your name from Amelia. I'm currently um, in graduate school getting my master's in library and information science. And Amelia mentioned that you work at a library. And she thought it would be a good idea if I gave you a call. I'd really like to set up some time with you to spend about 15 or 20 minutes and really find out a little bit more about what you do. And I'd love to know how you got your job and how you got your foot in the door and um, see what advice you might have for a new grad who's interested in getting into the field. I might say something like that. And so that really, there's a lot of questions in there, right? A lot of things that you are curious about that that person can start um, sharing. So use, and with that said, I always tell people, use the student card. You can, get a, you can get away with a lot of things by talking about, I'm a student, um, I'm, a, I'm a recent grad. Because people want to help you. We all remember what it was like to be a student or to be a recent grad. So we're more than willing to share information and help. So, so use that as your card. Uh, Tiffany, who should you ask to be networked with on LinkedIn? Should you really connect with someone you don't really talk with all the time? So it's a good question. Um, there are those people on LinkedIn who connect with every single person. And then there's people who put a little more thought into it. So really, the rule of thumb is oftentimes quality over quantity. But for me on LinkedIn, um, anytime I meet a new person, so maybe I am giving a presentation somewhere at a workshop. And there's other presenters that are there. And I meet them. You know, I say hello. Maybe we chat a little bit. I, try, I get their business card if I can. If not, I write down their name. And then I'll go back and I'll, I'll connect with them on LinkedIn. So I'll send them a personalized message. And I'll say, hey, it was really great to meet you at the workshop last week. Um, thanks for sharing that information on blah, 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 blah. I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn. So I connect with people. Or say I've gone to a conference and I have met a couple people. We're sitting at the same table. We chat a little bit. Again, I write down their name or I ask them for a business card. And then as soon as I get back home, I connect with them on LinkedIn. 
um, I have recently been to a panel at a company. I was in the audience. There were some people on the panel who were speaking. So I got their names. And then I went back and I connected with them on LinkedIn. And I just said, hey, I was at the panel today. At your, you know, your company, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us. It was super beneficial. I learned a lot of information. I'd love to add you to my you know, professional network. So that's how I connect with people and build my network. And then, of course, if it's people I worked with long ago, I'll go ahead and connect with them. So Bertha, you may connect with me, but you need to send me a personalized message. How about that? Hey, Jill, I was on your workshop last night. <laughs> I'd like to add you to my, purpose, my professional network. Yeah, so always send a personalized message. Oftentimes, if I just get the blank one and I have no idea who the person is, sometimes they are still students. And I will look at it and I'm like, I just don't know. I just don't know who that student is, then I often won't connect with them. But if there's some context for me on how I know the person, then I'm more apt to say, yeah, sure, I'll connect with you. OK, so we got about 15 minutes. And I'll just kind of keep plugging along here. And you guys keep the questions coming. So we talked about professional associations, job search websites I'm going to get to in just a sec, because I have some more on the other slide. Direct employer contact. Here's another question. I often forget who my former classmates are. <laughs> well, now going forward, Matthew, be more intentional about it. Or if you missed a person's name, ask them, oh, could you, you, know, could you, could you get me your name, or could, uh, could you tell me your name, or could you spell your name for me? And then go off to afterwards and connect with them. So now you're just going to be more intentional about it, which is good. So direct employer contact is, is going directly to an employer's website and um, just seeing what kinds of jobs they have available. And again, you can apply that way. Sometimes it goes in the black hole. Sometimes it doesn't, so you never know. But then you can always go back and see if there's somebody you know who has an in at that particular place. And maybe they can give you the inside scoop. That's funny, Amelia. You did a group project together. <laughs> so, so see right there, Matthew, you could be connecting with Amelia. <laughs> That is very funny. Uh, we talked about LinkedIn. We have talked about employment agencies. And do search job descriptions online to see what's out there, even if you're not ready to do your job search yet. Start playing around searching with jobs that seem interesting to you or companies that seem interesting to you just to do that environmental scan. Who's hiring? What kinds of skills and qualifications do they look for? Do I have most of those skills? Is there a gap? Meaning, hmm, if there's something I need, maybe I can take a class in that area next semester if that's something I'm interested in. So it just starts to give you that bigger picture, which will be very, very helpful. Yeah, that is a great suggestion, Teresa, joining committees. Well, I would recommend joining the ones that are interesting to you. Right? So ALA, of course, is a big one and a great one. But if you're interested in any other kind of particular area, um, if it's special libraries, law, you know, law libraries, whatever, archives, there are groups for every, every area that you're interested in. So certainly join more than one. And as you can, you know, get involved. I know we're busy people. Do what you can. But it, again, it's a great way to connect. So Sparta Jobs, how many people have looked for jobs on Sparta Jobs? I'm very curious. Does that mean nobody? So a couple people. So honestly, there are some great jobs listed on Sparta Jobs. Sparta Jobs is the campus, as a state university campus job and internship database. So, and I get contacted by a lot of employers with job postings for, for all of you, and that's where I send them to, Sparta Jobs. So do keep checking it or set up a search agent so you're getting notifications, but I'm always amazed at the diversity of jobs that will be posted in there. Some are, some are you know, full-time, some are project-based. Um, some are the short-term short projects, some are part-time. Some will fall under the category of internship. And the reason that they'll be on Sparta Jobs versus the SLIS um, internship database 
is because they may not have that same level of supervision and guidance that the formal internships need to have. But you all could still do one of these other internships. It would be just like a part-time job. So really, I recommend that you check it out. If you're having any issues logging into Sparta Jobs, send me an email, and I'll connect you with the right person in the Career Center to get that set up. But don't, that's a good resource. I think it's an under, undervalued resource. I'm just going back to check through some questions here. So, Tiffany, there could be a number of the part-time jobs, like on Sparta jobs, I'm thinking that's where your, res your response may be about that you can't apply for the jobs yet. Um, again, there are, they have a lot of those full-time jobs, but oftentimes there will be project positions in there. Uh, so you just never know. Keep checking. Keep looking. Even if you need to, vol if you need to volunteer, do it, because volunteering is great experience as well. All right. So here's some sites right here. These are just a few, and I'd like to hear from you guys. But let's see, do they have full-time full permanent? Yes, they do. Full-time permanent jobs on Sparta Jobs, absolutely. Lots of them. The uh, California Corrections Department was on there. NoCal is, so those are some temp jobs, but those can go to permanent jobs. NoCal is always posting jobs on there. Um, different libraries. Lots of different libraries, public libraries, academic libraries, send me messages to post jobs on there. I mean, I'm just kind of going off the top of my head of what I've seen recently. But there, there's a lot. So really do check it out. So here's just a couple sites. Um, I need a library job. That's a great one. Indeed is a great site. How many of you are using Indeed? That's a really good site. So do, thank you. So do add that one to your list. Never heard of it. It's not a specific library site. Um, there's lots of different jobs on there, but they have some excellent library types of jobs. It's a very easy website to use. It's one of my favorites. So in terms of searching on LinkedIn, I want to make sure that you all know about, if you go to linkedin.com slash studentjobs, that's where you can find a bunch of really great jobs. I was playing around with it. And I was putting in different search terms. I put in library. I put in research. I think I put in instruction. I put in archives. I was just playing around with keywords versus job titles. And I was amazed at the jobs that were on LinkedIn. I really was, I just was like, I just didn't know if there'd be those kinds of jobs there. Lots of them. So understood in jobs are typically for, for people who have one to three years of experience. And that's exactly where most of you are at. So do add that one to your list as well. And then again, on the career development site, so Swiss Web, the career development tab, look for job search. And there's a whole bunch of links in there. Now, I'll tell you right now, it's not the prettiest site. We're working on that. That's a summer project. It's all kind of not organized very intuitively. But there are still lots of different job search links in there. So do check that out. And so what are your all favorite, what are your, your all, what are your favorite sites? Do you have some that you can share with us? Because I like to learn from other people. CalOps, good one. I'm going to jot them down too. We could all be jotting these down. Really? You got a job from DICE. I never think to go to DICE. Was it a library related job? Because I would not even think about that. Oh, yeah, EdJoin. That's a very good site. Knows IT. OK, so I do. I think of DICE as of more technical jobs. But you've seen MLS pop up. See, you never know. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt to be looking around. You just never know. Anybody have anything else that you'd like to share? Job search sites. Those are good. All right, let's see. Oh, one more. So here are just some search terms. And this is just a few. I, had, I have many more, actually. These are just some one that I put up. But when you're searching for jobs and you're starting online to see what's out there, we typically search by job titles. 
And when we search by job titles, we can actually leave out a lot of really good jobs because they may not have, they may not be under that particular title, but they could still be using the same skill set that you have. So try, try searching with job titles and then try searching with keywords. So the keywords could be these types of words that relate to the area that you're interested in could also relate back to some of your top skills that you want to use. But try searching with two or three keywords and see what starts to pop up. And then look very closely at the job description. So the title may be something you never would have thought to look at, but when you read the job description, you go, oh yeah, I could do that job. So that's, again, being a little more strategic in your job search. Is anybody writing some of these down? I don't want to move the page if you're writing. <clears throat> nice. Of course you copied it writing down. What am I saying? <laughs> of course. Yeah, look at that. So your title was intermediate clerk typist, but you're a part-time school librarian. So if you were just putting school librarian, maybe that wouldn't have even popped up. Yeah, it's crazy. You really do have to diversify when you're doing your search. All right. We have just a couple minutes left. Are there any last burning questions? You are very welcome. Remember to go back to um, the other recordings of workshops if there's some other things that you want to review because there's a lot in there on resume writing and using LinkedIn and interviewing. Oh good, you saved the whiteboard. That's smart. That's smart. And my email address, I will type it in again down here. So you're welcome to send me questions. If you need to chat, set up an appointment on the phone to chat about your job search plans, we can certainly do that too. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad that helped. And then, there's, again, there's some good resources from some of the past workshops on using LinkedIn, so you might find those helpful as well. Oh, thanks, guys. I'm glad it was helpful for you. All right. Thanks for signing off.